Perfecto. Wouldn't matter. So, who's the family historian here? What's the sort of the night story in this part of the world? Who was it that settled over the hill there? What was his name again? Edwin of Octavius. It was our great grandfather, wasn't it? Great great. Great great grandfather. Yeah. He started how many? Oh, probably 10k that way. Yeah. And then Lou's got as far mm. as here, and I've about 10k the other side. So we're an un Adventurous lot. <laughs> Fifth generation, yeah, we're Fifth generation, yeah, 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 yeah. So we're boring as that shit. We just yeah. don't travel. <laughs> <laughs> and then this place, we're talking about 1970, planting here. So what was the inspiration for that? I mean, there wasn't much going on here viticulture-wise. So it was Virgin Hill started a year or so ahead of us. Yeah. And the original aim was uh, to sell the fruit to Virgin Hills. And Ross, what did you take from this place and, and what had been learned here when you planted your vineyard? Absolutely nothing. Because <laughs> I used to come here and play cricket with <laughs> Lou's younger brother, so I didn't really have much to do with it. Um, you used to, to scratch a lot of my records, as I recall. Yeah, I scratched a lot of Lou's <laughs> records. Lou had the best record <laughs> collection. <laughs> I couldn't wait for a new album to come out and I'd say, well, oh, I hope I'm going to go up and stay up at Granite Hills tonight. So. I'd uh, hack away and <laughs> put the Christmas tinsel on and do a bit of air guitar and the reflection in the window of my cousins. So, but I, like, when I started, it was sort of Lou planted the seed to put, was it you that planted the seed or was it Gordon? The conversations anyway. You're talking musically or? No, the or planting the seeds of the viticulturally. <laughs> so I knew nothing, absolutely fuck yeah. all. I knew how to drive a tractor, I knew how to rip a straight line. Yep, which is helpful. Um, knew how to stick things in the ground and water them if they were crook. Mm. And that was about it. And I started doing a, a bit of cultural course at a TAFE. It meant I couldn't understand a bloody thing. Yep. Like, you know, it, it looked real easy on a page where you see a vine. There's a picture of a vine and you prune it like that. So you, you walk out in the vineyard and you go with this picture and you go, well, there's 9,000 fucking vines here. Not one of them looks, looks like the same. this one. <laughs> yeah. So picking up bits from Lou, getting as much advice as we could. I flew and everyone else just getting knowledge. But yep. working with... An old bloke from Heathcote, Laurie Conforti, which is, oddly enough, his uh, son's working son's here working now. Here. Yeah. Okay. He, I just worked beside him and he just kept saying, it'll come. So just from watching him and he said, it'll, it'll, one day you'll just breed it, you'll work out how to prune. Yep. And that's where it about stops for me. So I can, I can plant, water, prune and shoot birds and pick. Yep. After that, that's it, I'm done. You're done? That's yeah. What was the thinking behind what varieties you planted in that vineyard at the time? Um, well, I'd probably never heard of them when they went in there. I didn't. I wouldn't have known the difference. I knew there was red wine and white wine, and that was it. Yep. Because being a uh, bit of a beer connoisseur, yep. Um, I didn't know much about it, so I guess that was learning on the way, and then tasting the fruit on the vines, sort of getting getting yep. that, getting your flavours early, and, and working out the difference, and then transferring that. I'm getting all technical now. No, no, this and is... <laughs> transferring that, so when you... I can pour a glass of wine, and I, I don't say it out loud because I'm going to fuck everything up, but I'll just go to myself, hmm, I can taste the mulberries in that movie. Yeah, yeah. You know, that kind of stuff. I just It's just from eating it off the off the vine. But you understand that sort of winemaking, almost a winemaking cliche now that you, you, know, you pick on flavour, not on numbers. Yeah, and I think that's a good way to do You actually have it. to walk the vineyard and yeah. taste mm. fruit you know, as it's mm. ripening to make those decisions. But there's no substitute for mm. actually getting Absolutely. in there and tasting as you go. We should get some glasses and start trying these. What are your tasting notes? My tasting notes? Um, go well with chips. <laughs> Um, Chips, sauce, no, fruit. easy drinking. No, I could drink. You could drink a lot of that real quick. I reckon. Well, it's soft. It's got some nice texture. Mm. It's yeah. real, real nice texture elements to it. But yeah, it does have that nice roney mm. weight mm. to it and that fleshiness. And so it's a really, you know, a little bit of a fruit. It's a pretty yummy wine. I reckon. Is that, that that's they all from the below the below the um, semi on there? Around Grandpa's tree. Around Grandpa's tree. That's what yeah. I call that what there. Yeah. Yeah. So what's one? Well, a memorial tree. It is. Yeah. 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 Grandpa's ashes are in there. Mm. Group at nights. Yeah. Mm. And that was the block. That was a semion block. That mm. Lou it was Lou's idea to put a few other different bits and pieces in there. Would you like to see you know these wines on various riders around the world when people start touring again? Wow. Well, people will insist on having. 
Psycho Shiraz, I'm a rider. Well, I, when Pearl Jam comes to town, they always get a, a bit of wine. I, they always take them down a few bottles. So um, there's a couple of bottles with still sitting proudly in Ed's music room down yeah, there. Yeah. Well, so they, so he, empty bottles, or is he? He's kept one full. But he, uh, the first bottle of wine he bugled, he'd, he'd finished that halfway through their set at Cod Laver Arena. He'd done well. <laughs> done real well. Some of these not blonde. Ready to move on to a red loo? <laughs> sure, absolutely. What else is on the vineyard that might work? Oh, for the Merlot? Yeah, the Merlot, if we can well, resurrect the... The, the Maca Merlot. Yeah, do a mad Maca Merlot. <laughs> <laughs> Something with bubbles, because Dean, the drummer, he, whenever we fly away, he always has a, a couple of champagnes. So we call him Champagne Charlie. He sits, yeah. in, sits in the bloody lounge like Lord Muck, sipping away <laughs> his champagne at 11 o'clock in the morning when they open the bar. So the similarities I reckon between especially wine making and making music is is one, you come up with something you think's all right, but you've got to convince the critics, then you've got to convince the public. It's more important to convince the public than the critics. Yeah, but the thing is it's the same thing and you've got to be pretty passionate about it to keep going because I know when people don't like what you do, what do you do? Drop your bundle and piss off or yeah. you keep chugging away and it's kind of, you know, it's, and, and all these new trends, everyone seems to be chasing the trends, but... You get tired chasing trends, and sometimes if you stand still, it's a better thing. I think that's one of the reasons that you know those people that do love the you know the psychos love them so much is that it is what it is, mm. and it's you know it's authentic and it's and yeah, it's absolutely. true to form. And I think winemaking is exactly the same. Mm. And I think I can actually see the you know the connection between those two wines and and what you do musically. They make sense as wines that have come from your sensibility. Mm. Exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Pull the cork out in the hay shed. 